So yeah, I'll give this presentation, which is kind of a, an overview of chemical engineering. Um, I typically give it in the course in, in Chemical Engineering 100 because not everybody goes to these, these sessions. Um, but it's, it's just a, a very simple introduction to what chemical engineers do and a little bit about the department um, specifically. And then after that, then we can talk about what happens in these first year courses, which is, um, I think what you want to get some ideas about. So let's see, I'm going to share my screen, entire screen. And then we have this. You folks can see this all, all right? Yeah? I don't have a chat box open, but that's okay. All right, I, I could, uh, all right, so like I said, this is the uh, kind of the standard presentation that I give, introduction to the major and the profession. And you can see we're at IIT. There's this student chapter. This is the Professional Society of, society of Chemical Engineers. And there's a couple of students that are in that society and they have um, pie on their face because we do a fundraiser each year where there's, uh, you get to pie people, you get to pie your, classmates, but also professors, which is a little bit of fun. Okay, so here's what we're gonna talk about today. I'm gonna to talk about myself first, and, and maybe Professor Hahn could say a little bit about himself if he'd like. Um, then I'll talk about what do engineers do, and a little bit of an overview of chemical engineering. And then at the end, I'm gonna talk about um, opportunities for undergraduate research, and then this professional society, something called the chemical engineering car, which is, a really nice activity if you're if you're interested in some hands-on work. Okay, so um, where do I come from? My name is Professor Chmielewski, but Donald Chmielewski. Actually, with uh, when it comes to the students, I, I don't really ask them to call me Professor Chmielewski. That I say, just call me Don. Don is fine um, because you know I, I want to have a. a a good kind of peer relationship if I can, because we don't have to be formal. All right, so I come from the Chicago area where I grew up. I don't know if anybody knows about West Lydon High School in North Lake, it's, um, right in the West suburbs. Um, then I, I came to IIT actually for my bachelor's degree, which was in electrical engineering. Then I went off to California for a master's degree in electrical engineering. And then uh, I switched. I, I decided I didn't like electrical engineering anymore or maybe I like chemical engineering more, and that's where I got my PhD, um, both at UCLA, and then I came back to IIT, and I've been teaching here for 20 years. Um, so that's that's my story. I, I think the important part about this, this story is that uh, many students um, in their first year are really unsure about their major. And when I was a first year student, I was actually we had something called the undeclared engineering major. And it wasn't until um, maybe my second or third semester that I actually selected electrical engineering. I was actually kind of weighing between electrical and, and, and chemical. Um, and, then, and then I switched. So the lesson to all of that is that it doesn't matter. There's, there's a lot of um, students put a lot of emphasis and, and a lot of stress about am I picking the right major? In my opinion, it doesn't, it doesn't matter that much. As long as you're doing engineering, it's all pretty much the same. The, the details and what it's applied to are different, but the physics, the math, the science, the, the way of thinking of doing the design of equipment or design of some product, um, this, it's all the same kind of problem solving skills. Um, so, and in terms of employers, they, they also don't care that much either, that they will hire any engineer to do. There's, there's lots of jobs where they're looking for just a good engineer and they don't really care what the major is. Okay, um, so that's that topic. And let's see. Yeah, Don, maybe, yeah. Sukun, uh, yeah, go ahead, jump in at any point. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, uh, let, me, let me introduce myself. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Sokun Hong. Uh, I have been uh, here at IIT uh, about six years. 
So um, uh, I'm teaching the chemical engineering uh, 101 class. So uh, in the fall semester, uh, you're going to take the course CH100, which is taught by Professor Don Chimilski. And uh, the following spring, next year spring, uh, you will meet me uh, in the ITP class. So um, yeah, so after, after this uh, the presentation, I'm going to briefly uh, talk about what we are going to learn uh, at the uh, CHE 100 uh, 101 class. Okay, so, um, uh, my research area is um, the protein engineering. You know, uh, our department name is uh, chemical and biological engineering. Okay, so traditionally, uh, many professors, their research area, um, they, they have been focusing on the chemical engineering. But nowadays, you know, um, so there are many biochemicals. So uh, we handle uh, the biological molecules and then uh, we can engineer them. Uh, so uh, I'm, I'm the one of the person who are working on the biological engineering side. So I just wanted to tell you the in our department, we cover uh, various different molecules uh, to study, uh, to learn. Uh, and then the future applications. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, you can continue. Yeah. Good, good. Okay, so in this part, I talk about, uh, you know, what is IIT? You have these, these eight different colleges. And actually, I think it's changed since I last updated this. Do we now have a, a college of computing, which is, uh, which is different? And then I think this, yeah, the College of Science got moved into the College of Computing. Well, it's it's okay. We're, we're in the College of Engineering, right? And and these are the different engineering majors. Um, we're in chemical engineering, but like I said, you know, if if you find that you you're not liking chemical engineering so much and you want to sway change to biomedical, that's fine. Um, I mean, you can change it to something that's not engineering also, but then you're, you're getting into, uh, you know, kind of a different um, different kind of education and different job prospects, I think. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so here's an important question. What do engineers do? Um, and, and they don't all drive trains, is what it says there. Um, but some engineers drive trains. And in particular, chemical engineers, do, they deal with chemicals, but they don't really do what this guy's doing. Um, this guy here is a chemist, is what I'm trying to illustrate. And if you notice that um, he's got a chemical in this little test tube. And he's, what a chemist does, who's really a scientist, is that they're discovering new science. They're discovering maybe a new chemical. And then what it is that, that the chemical engineer does is they're not going to make a test tube size of, of that chemical. They're going to make, say, millions and millions of gallons of this chemical. They're going to scale it up to this massive industrial scale. And so they will design equipment to make massive amounts of these chemicals to be sold out to the world. And so they design this equipment, they help build the equipment. Um, then once the equipment is built, so this big giant factory that's pumping chemicals out, chemicals going in, different chemicals coming out, then um, somebody operates that equipment. And that person is the, um, the equipment operator. And that's, that's why I have the picture of this guy who you know, kind of has the title of engineer, but is not really the engineer. This, this is the, the equipment operator for a train. It's somebody that drives the train. Now there was an engineer that designed the train. There may be an engineer involved in building the train, um, but then once it's built, then the operator comes and, and operates it. And you know, the picture I have here, this is, you know, it's, it's a coal-fired train, right? It's an old timey train from the 1850s. But, you know, remember, remember back in the 1850s, a train was uh, was modern technology. That was the cutting edge 
stuff. And so there was a lot of engineers involved in, in that. Um, okay. So yeah, that's what engineers do. So they kind of, they bring the science, the, the scientific discoveries, and they, they bring it out into the world and, and create the equipment that does the manufacturing that then the operators um, will use that equipment. And, you know, I, I'm gonna kind of skip over it now, but so, something we talk about in the course when I give this presentation, and I have a little more time, is we talk about the relationship between the engineer and the operator and the engineer and the scientist. And there's, there's some cultural things, there's some professional things that um, you need to understand. That, uh, and, and we talk about those things. All right, so some jobs that, that chemical engineers typically hold. I just talked about this person of a process engineer in some factory manufacturing plant. Here I say a plastics factory. And so what a process engineer is somebody that actually works in the plant, but they don't operate the equipment. They say, basically they are the, the, the manager of the operators. So the engineer will be assigned to some large piece of equipment and it's their responsibility to make sure that it stays maintained, that it's operating efficiently, that the operators are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And so they're just managing this giant piece of equipment. And you know, after a few years of being there, maybe you move up to, um, you know, you're managing this whole section of the plant. And then maybe a few years later, you're managing the whole plant. You're just in charge of the whole thing, which, and, and this could be a, a really giant plant of, you know, a thousand people working there and the plant manager is the one that's responsible for everybody um, there. So it's, it's really a lot of management responsibility. And, and then I give the illustration here that it's a wastewater treatment plant. There's lots of different plants that a chemical engineer could work at. Um, so that's kind of the management route is you start as a process engineer and you go and start doing some management. Another route you could go is into some sort of um, research scientist. Usually this involves going to graduate school, maybe getting a PhD, the same way uh, myself and Professor Hong did. And once you have a PhD, you don't have to be a professor. You could also go out and work in industry. And so I know uh, I have a few friends that work in chip manufacturing. They have PhDs in chemical engineering and um, they do research for, for these chip manufacturers. So just let's make this a little interactive. I don't know. If, if you folks want to take off your microphone or turn on your microphone, what kind of chip manufacturer do you think I'm talking about here? Anybody? You can type in the chat box, although I can't see the chat box. So, Farine, you'll have to tell me what it's, uh, if there's anything in there. Farine Sukun, you want to, you want to guess? If you know what knows. Uh, computer chips. Computer chips, yes, that is correct. One of the people I know, they work for, um, I forgot the name of the company now. It wasn't Intel, it was, it was the company that makes the machines that the companies like Intel use. So that's, that's a technically chip manufacturing. But then there's a second person um, and they work for Frito-Lay. And so they make potato chips. And so there's, there's a whole spectrum of types of, of, of plants and things that you can work for. Um, you could also make um, poker chips, which is really just kind of plastic. Um, you could deal with cow chips, which would be maybe doing uh, some sort of renewable energy where you're taking the cow chips and converting them to some liquid fuel. All right, let's move on. So you could also be uh, take your, your chemical engineering degree and go to medical school. So we have lots of students that graduated IIT, went on to medical school and, and now are, um, they're practicing um, as, as uh, in, yeah, it, you know, they, they have patients that come in, they see them um, but, but there's another route you could go in terms of medical school is you could go into doing more research. And so um, 
actually that's what engineers are a little better better suited for in terms of the medical profession. Um, you know, a, a medical doctor, they have to memorize a lot of stuff. And if I'm visiting my doctor, I want my doctor have, to have memorized, um, you know, all the possible um, things that could be wrong with me or all the solutions. Um, but if you're doing research, you're not dealing with patients. You're trying to come up and discover new techniques, new surgical methods, new drugs. There's lots of very engineering-like things that you still need to be an MD to do. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's kind of two different routes. And we have students that have gone in both routes. Let's see, uh, here's the last one, the CEO of a multinational corporation. I've been submitting my resume for that job for, for quite some time and they still haven't called me back. Uh, there's a specific, per specific person I'm thinking of when I wrote this, I kind of wrote this presentation a while back. Um, there's a guy named Jack Welsh, who was the, um, the CEO of General Electric back uh, maybe 10 or 15 years ago. And that was like the largest, the, the biggest company in the world at the time. It's, it's not the biggest anymore, but um, it, so that guy has several degrees in chemical engineering. And so that's, that's a way to go. And then um, there's one more here that I don't have listed because I'm, I'm going to ask you the question. Um, who do you think is the most famous chemical engineer in the world? The most famous. Uh, you'll never guess. It's the Pope. The Pope in Rome is a chemical engineer. Can you believe that? I can't see by any of your faces, so I can't tell how surprised you are, but I'm, I'm imagining that you're very surprised. Uh, actually, technically, he doesn't have a bachelor's degree in, in chemical engineering. He has an associate's degree in chemical technology. So it's not really chemical engineering, but oh yeah, look, there's a, there's a surprised face. That's nice, Fernando. Uh, so yeah, it's, so it's really yeah, an associate's degree in chemical technology. I'm gonna, I'm gonna call that chemical engineering. So it's not, it's not really, but we'll take it. It's the Pope. All right, so uh, here's yes, what you're gonna uh, learn as a chemical. Yeah, I, I wanna add about the, the position uh, after get getting the chemical engineering degree. So yeah, nowadays, yeah. Um, uh, the, I, I could see the, the more chemical engineers are working, working uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. So in the Chicago area, there are many pharmaceutical companies and after getting the chemical engineering bachelor's and the master's degree, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. I could see that they are uh, working in those companies. That's, that's definitely true. And, and my experience is, you know, in chemical companies, I mean, in pharmaceutical companies, they kind of have two different types of people. They have a, a large group where they're discovering new drugs. And then they go out and they, they do clinical trials and see if this drug is effective and they get it through the FDA. And, and it's, it's, a, it's a massive undertaking to discover and get um, these drugs through the FDA. But then once all that's done, then they have to manufacture the drug. So then there's a whole different half of the company where they build equipment to make the drugs. And so there's lots of engineers involved in, in, in that area. Um, and so it's, it's, again, the way I was, I was showing you with the, the last slide is, you know, this is gonna be your chemist that's discovering the new drug, and then they're gonna hand it off to the engineer to make, you know, the, the, the 10 million tablets um, or, yeah, I'm sure you've seen on television the, the vaccines, they, sh they show them going through the, the little conveyor belts, right? The engineers designed all that conveyor belt system and there's these bioreactors that are, are doing fermentation to make the vaccines. It's, um, and really that, you know, what's happening with the vaccine right now, that's um, why we don't have enough vaccine, why that's kind of the bottleneck is because just the manufacturing part of getting it through the fermenters and, and all that sort of thing is, it just takes time. They don't have enough equipment. And uh, all right.
So here's what you'll study as a chemical engineer. In your um, first and second year, you're going to just you're mostly going to be math and science. It's just just calculus and lots of physics and, and just tons and tons of chemistry for, for chemical engineers. Um, and that's to, to, you know, to get the foundation, you know, of what does this scientist do? You've got to have the basic science knowledge, basic science and math knowledge. And then with that, you're going to bring that knowledge to the world, apply it to the world. And so in your, your third year, you're going to start doing analysis of chemical processes. So I've, I've been talking about these chemical plants or these bioreactors, these fermenters. Um, you're going to start studying that equipment. And that's called analysis. And there's really kind of three things. There's separations, reactions, and thermodynamics. Um, separations is when you take a raw material out of the earth or wherever you get it from, it's usually mixed up with other stuff. And so the first thing you have to do is you have to purify it. You got to get rid of all the other stuff that you want and you get it down to the, that single element or that single molecule um, in your bucket. And then you might want to, once you have it separated, purified, then you're going to do a reaction, convert it to some other chemical. And then after that reaction, well, now the original chemical and the new one, they're still mixed because you didn't convert it all. And so then you got to do more separations. And then thermodynamics, I call it the, um, the accounting. It's, it's the accountant of, of engineers. Is that because every time you do a separation or you do a reaction, you need energy. You have to either put energy in or you got to take energy out. And if you're putting energy in, you're probably burning some fuel. And so then that fuel has a cost. You got to buy the fuel so you can get the energy to make the reaction happen. And then there's emissions that's coming out of that fuel. But the thermodynamics keeps track of all that. And it tells you how much energy you need to create a reaction or do a separation. Um, so that's your the junior year, is that we give you the equipment or we tell you what the equipment is, um, tell you what's going in, and then you've got to figure out the equations or use the equations to calculate what is the product? How well is this equipment working? Now, in, in the senior year, you get into something called design. And in, in the design phase, we don't tell you what the equipment is. We say, here's the raw material you have. Here's the product that we'd like to, to, to create. You tell us what the equipment should be in between. What is the equipment that's gonna make this happen? And you've gotta figure out the size and the configuration and what kind of chemistry is gonna happen, what temperature is gonna happen at this. There's lots and lots of different factors that come into it. And depending on those factors, um, that's how much the equipment's going to cost. So the economics is, is usually the main driving force because if you build this piece of equipment and it doesn't make money, there's no point in building it. You've got to at least be making a profit. And then while this equipment is, is operating and, and you've got to think about this while you're doing the design, is that piece of equipment going to be safe? Is it, is it going to have some horrible emissions. If there are some waste streams, okay, now I got to design another, another piece of equipment to clean up that waste stream because you can't just dump it in the river. Um, you can't just let it go off into the air. You've got to take care of those things. So all those elements come, come into play in the, in, the, in the process of design of your chemical processes. And that's basically your curriculum is um, you learn lots of science, you learn how to analyze things, and then you learn how to design things. Uh, really kind of in a nutshell. And then you're ready to be, you know, this guy in between, the chemist and the operator, because you're designing things. Okay, um, let's get to a very specific example of crude oil. Um, this is the stuff that comes out of the ground it's black, goopy stuff. And what it's used for is you're going to turn it into gasoline is basically the, the main objective. 
And, and what crude oil is, is it's just uh, lots of hydrocarbons. So carbon chains with hydrogen around it. And in my little cartoon here, um, you know, I've got small molecules, I've got medium-sized molecules, and I've got large molecules. Now, now, actual crude oil, all of these would be considered small molecules, but I wanted to make a nice little cartoon. So a large molecule has probably got, uh, you know, 50, 60, 100 carbons, and a medium-sized one has got, um, I don't know, 8, 10, 15 is kind of a medium-sized one. That would be this one. But we're going to use these for now just because it's a nice little illustration. And so th this oil goes to something called a refinery, which is, um, is where they're going to do this separation. So you've basically got a bucket that's got all different mixed up molecules. And we want to get those molecules so that the small ones are in this bucket, the medium sized ones are here, and all the large ones are here. So the, the, the very small ones, is, is, they're usually gas, natural gas that you're going to burn on your stove or propane or something like that. And then you get liquid fuels, which is your gasoline. And that's, I think that's a C8. So if we were actually doing gasoline, it would be, I'd have eight carbons here. Um, gasoline is kind of a mix. It's got kind of in the neighborhood of eight carbons. It's not all of it is C8. Um, and then not all of it is straight chains like this either, but, but that's what you learn in your chemistry, chemistry classes is, you know, all about these hydrocarbons and uh, all the different varieties of stuff. And then the big giant molecules that are, you know, 50, 60, 100 carbons, that's just, it's tar. And, and mostly they use that for building roads. You know, if you see when they're making blacktop or um, asphalt, it's, asphalt is basically rocks with, with this tar in it to kind of hold it together. Um, and it's, it's as thick as you can imagine. Um, let's see. So here's, uh, here's still a very simplified picture, but it's, it's more detailed than what I gave you. Um, when you get the crude oil in, you do these separations and you're gonna make natural gas, propane, this is your gasoline. There's there's different, more liquid fuels, and then there's your asphalt and coke, um, and then from those things, those are usually raw materials for making plastics. So ethylene, polyethylene, lots and lots of plastics are, are being made out of out of those things that could be fuels, but they also could be um, as raw materials for for making other chemicals. Uh, so, but, but what is this, how do we do this separation? So basically the way it's done is you take the oil and you boil it, and uh, which is crazy. That's the first time I heard that it was, uh, I was saying, are you sure, are you serious? That's what you do, you're taking the oil and you're boiling it. It's, it's insane because, because you know, oil burns or <laughs> you're making gasoline. So you have to be really careful about how you're going to boil this this um, this crude oil, and this is a massive safety concern. But the idea is that what happens is when you when you boil it, the the small molecules end up as vapor, and then the large molecules they stay as liquid. And so once you boil it, um, you're going to get mostly small molecules, and then you can cool it off, and you'll get get liquid again. Um, so then this bucket will have mostly big molecules and this will have mostly small molecules. And then you can take the big bucket and you can do it again. And then you'll have mostly really, really big molecules and kind of medium sized ones. And then F out of this bucket, you could do it again. And you have medium sized ones and then the, the really, really small ones. And you can do it many, many times. So this is more of an illustration of what's happening in this thing called the distillation column. And there's kind of these trays that are going on inside and the, the crude oil is going in here. And what's coming out is, um, these are all the light molecules. And then what's coming out of here at the bottoms is all the, the big molecules. And they can even take things off of, out of the middle. And really each one of these trays, you should think of it as you know, doing one of these things. Each one of these things is happening in one of those trays. 
is, is kind of the way to think about it. And this way works better. You know, this way is, this is how you would do it if you were in a chemistry lab. This is how the chemist does it in kind of this batch sort of way. Um, when you get to where you're making millions and millions of gallons of, of, of gasoline, um, you know, a, a small refinery, medium sized refinery, will take um, 100,000 barrels of oil in every single day. Every day, you, you know a barrel of oil, right? 55 gallon drum, well, it's, it's not exactly 55, but you've seen those before. So 100,000 of those every single day goes into this plant. And so you couldn't possibly do it in this batch kind of way. You have to do it in this continuous operation where it's continuously being fed, it's continuously doing these operations of separation, and it's, it's just the flow is coming out um, every time. Is there a question? Somebody have a question? No. Okay. And so that, that's what a lot of chemical engineering is, is taking um, what the chemist figured out in the batch method and converting it into a continuous plant, which is economically a lot more feasible. Um, yeah. All right, so here's some pictures of some actual distillation columns. And you can see they're just massive in size. It's, I want to, you know, all this scaffolding, this, these are like little ladders where people can climb up and they can do inspections and stuff. And the same thing here. These are all the little platforms um, where people can get inside there and fix it when it's broken and stuff like that. So yeah, big stuff. Um, let's talk a little bit about this asphalt because you know the, depending on what crude oil you buy, you're kind of fixed on what your products are going to be because we didn't do any reactions. All we've done is, is separations. Um, and we've got kind of enough roads already. We've got enough, well, we could probably use to fix some potholes, but there's, there's more asphalt out there than, than, than we really need. And in fact, the crude oil that we have today has got more heavy stuff, more big molecules than the crude oil that, that we've had in the past. You know, kind of all the, the really good crude oil is, um, it's kind of a little more scarce or harder to, harder to remove. And so the stuff that's easy to remove now has got, you know, more large molecules. And so one way to deal with that is if you, um, we'd like to convert these large molecules into gasoline, because that's what makes money. If, if we end up with these large molecules, we're kind of stuck with them. Well, we want to do a reaction and convert it. And so it's, um, it goes on inside of this reactor. And basically they use these catalyst pellets, at high temperature, and they're gonna crack the molecule in half, which, you know, my little lightning bolts make that, make it look like that's happening. Um, so if it gets chopped in half, these two halves of the, of, I'll have two molecules at that point, but neither one will be happy. If you've done much chemistry, um, the, the carbon doesn't like to have kind of a dangling bond hanging there. It needs another hydrogen there. So in these reactors, either they'll add hydrogen so that it'll fill in that gap, or if they don't, then a carbon will have to fall out so that let's say this hydrogen goes over here and then this one goes over here and then this carbon is left by itself. So that's, uh, that creates a little bit of a problem. So that's what's, what's going on in this uh, fluidized catalytic cracker. It's called um, catalytic because there's these little particles that are the catalyst that helps the reaction take place. But when the reaction takes place, then carbon is left on those particles. And if enough carbon builds up, then the reactions can't get to the, to the catalyst anymore. And so they set it to this thing called the, the regenerator, where they basically they burn off the carbon and then they send that catalyst particle back into the reactor. And that's actually when they burn it, the heat that's generated from burning 
that's the heat that's used to drive this reaction because this reaction actually requires um, heat to be added to it. It's an endothermic reaction. All right, so that's um, that's a reaction that goes on. This, this is active. This piece of equipment in a refinery is the most profitable piece of equipment. Nothing makes more money in the plant than than this catalytic cracker. And here's some pictures of, of that. You can see here, there's the big regenerator and then there's the reactors down here. It's all surrounded by scaffolding. And here's another one. There's the reactor and the regenerators here. And then there's there's some separation that's going on after the reaction takes place because, um, you know, it's, it's converted a lot of the large molecules, but it hasn't converted all of them. So they need to, again, do a separation so they would get all the small molecules separated from the big ones and then the big ones go back in. All right, um, there's one more thing. We got, we got 20 minutes left. I wanna go fast now so we can have some more time to talk. Inside of fuel, there's sulfur and nitrogen. And um, I didn't talk about it yet, but it's there. And if it stays in there and then you burn the fuel like in your car, um, it's gonna create uh, sulfur dioxide and nitrogen dioxide, it's gonna be a problem. This is gonna cause acid rain and smog. And there's a lot of pollution caused by these molecules in the air. And so we'd like to remove them from the fuel. And in terms of the refinery, that's, that's what they do is they've got to remove this stuff. That doesn't stop this reaction because that, that's going to happen. In your car, in the exhaust system, there's something called a catalytic converter that makes this reaction go backwards. So that if there's any of this nitrogen dioxide in your, your exhaust stream, there's these um, platinum catalysts that the exhaust has to go through. And it, it, it makes this reaction go backwards. It's actually kind of magical that it, that it works so well. The problem is that the platinum in the catalyst converter is a little expensive. And if you've ever had to get a new catalyst catalytic converter for your car, it's, it's not cheap. Um, all right, so but in the refinery, they wanna get rid of the sulfur and nitrogen. So they have, uh, they do this reaction. They take the dirty fuel and they put in hydrogen. And that's gonna make, um, convert the elemental sulfur and nitrogen into this hydrogen sulfide and ammonia. Now, it, we haven't gotten rid of the sulfur and nitrogen, but what's happening now is that when the sulfur and nitrogen are in this form, then when I come out here, I can, I can do another distillation and these molecules are easy to separate. These, when they're just the elemental molecules, it's very hard to do the separation. So this reaction, this reactor is um, for that purpose. Um, again, I'm short on time. Normally I ask, do you see a problem with this equation? And yeah, there's a stoichiometric problem. It's, it's like a pop quiz. This, this two should be, you know, this two should be a three, right? To make this balance. But we don't have time for, for quizzes right now, but usually we do a quiz. All right, so there's a picture of the hydro treaters. Um, they're much smaller reactors. It, it kind of goes, there's one, it goes in, you lose some sulfur, then lose some more, then lose some more, then it does a distillation for that separation. Okay, so let's talk about undergraduate research and this AICHE chemi car stuff. So I think that's unique about IIT is that um, the student to faculty ratio is quite low compared to some other schools. And so there's a lot of opportunity to do undergraduate research um, just because there's not as many students. If you're at say someplace like Urbana, uh, University of Illinois Urbana, they have so many undergraduates and it's, it's somewhat difficult, it's not impossible, but it's somewhat difficult to get an undergraduate research position. Um, I, I find many of them end up going, at least the chemical engineers that I talk to, uh, end up getting doing some research in chemistry department or the environmental engineering department or something like that. Um, but here at IIT, I, I rarely find a student that, that is not able to do undergraduate research if they wanna do it. Um, you kind of have to have a little bit of an aptitude for it. So it's you kind of have to have some, some good grades first. But if, if they want to do undergraduate research, they always find somebody to work with um, because the, the faculty just have you know, 
I mean, we have all faculty have time, but I can only take on you know one maybe two um, undergraduate students um, a year, and um, since there's less students, I, I can usually accommodate anybody that asks. So you could do it in these different areas. Uh, Professor Hogg was talking about the different research areas. My research area is more of in this energy type stuff, fuel cells and batteries and smart grid. I'm also in this um, control systems um, and, and, and that sort of thing. And Professor Hogg is, is obviously in this biological area. Um, we've also got other people in these advanced materials. So that's definitely an opportunity. Um, and then there's this student chapter. The, this is the American Institute of Chemical Engineers, which is a national organization. It's the professional society for all engineers. Um, Professor Hong and I are our members. Um, we go to a conference every year where we spend a whole week just talking about chemical engineering and, and that sort of thing. Um, but they have student chapters. They also have um, local chapters, chapters. There's a group in Chicago that's just chemical engineers for the Chicago area. Um, but then they have a, a group for, for students. And so here's, uh, here's a bunch of students. And what do they do? They have social events like this picnic down here. There's the, the pie in the face thing that I'm, uh, I was telling you about earlier. Uh, my picture is somewhere in there. Can I move it? Where am I? Oh, there I am. Is that me? I don't know. But you get to wear a plastic bag while they put a pie in your face. We go on to tours of actual chemical plants. Um, so this is where they, they went and they talked about um, the fluidized bed reactors and, and those sorts of things. And another thing they could do is this chemical engineering car, um, which is the picture here. And basically the idea is it's a competition where um, the students they have to build a car and it has to be powered completely by a chemical reaction that, that they've created. And then the idea of the competition is that um, you're given a certain distance and you need to make your car go exactly that distance. The problem is that they don't tell you what the distance is until the day of the event. Um, well, actually an hour before the event, they'll tell you what the distance is. And you've got to figure out how to make your chemical reaction um, produce just enough energy to get your car to go exactly that distance. So there's a lot of calibration that students have to do in advance and figure out how to get it to work. And there's this, this kind of stopping mechanism that they've also created. Um, I guess a better picture. This year I had that cool hawk. This year, um, this picture is from a few years back, maybe three or four years back. This year, the, the car is, um, they call it the Mario Kart. And the reason they call it the Mario Kart is that for years, when I teach this freshman class, I've been telling them that chemical engineers are really glorified plumbers. This is, this is the, um, the way that other engineers make fun of chemical engineers. You know, they call electrical engineers sparkies or something like that. But chemical engineers are glorified plumbers because in, in a chemical plant, there's just pipes everywhere and there's, there's a lot of piping diagrams that they got to worry about. And it's kind of like just, yeah, it's a plumber. So the students are like, oh, if we're plumbers, maybe we're, we're Mario, you know, because the Mario brothers, they're, um, they're plumbers. So they've taken on Mario as the mascot. And so they're, they're now calling their, their chemical car the Mario Kart, which I think is, is, is fun in addition to learning something. All right, so that's the end of this presentation. And it looks like we've got about 10 or 15 minutes left for some more uh, conversation. Let's open it up for any questions. Let's start there. Let's see if you have any questions. Feel free to turn your microphone on. So Donald, I have a quick question. Yes. Um, you talked a little bit about AICHE and the field trips that they take uh, to different chemical plants and other areas. Uh -huh. um, would our location be in, in Chicago? Can you name a few examples of field trips that they've taken um, and have they been easily accessible? 
Yeah. Um, so one tour that they do pretty regularly, maybe every three years, is a wastewater treatment plant. And in in Chicago, there's a uh, what called a Stickney wastewater treatment plant, and apparently this is the largest wastewater treatment plant in the world. And so they're this is where they take the sewage and they clean it all up and then they send it out into the river. And there's just a lot of chemical engineering that goes on there. Um, in the past, we've gone to steel mills. Um, we've gone to Abbott Labs, um, which is way up on the north side to find out what's happening with pharmaceutical companies. Um, let's see, what's the other one that we, we go to? Um, U.S. Gypsum, um, where they make um, the... the the wall board for, uh, for building houses. If you look on your wall, you've got, um, what's that called? Chalkboard, not a chalkboard, but that name is, I'm forgetting it. But yeah, there's there's just lots of places in Chicago that, that, that we can go to. Um, and it, but the, the key is, is um, the students have to make the connections with the companies and arrange the tours. Um, they, they also do a weekly series where they invite um, engineers to come to campus and give a presentation about what they do. Um, sometimes it's a formal presentation like I gave you here. Sometimes it's just the engineer says, I'm going to tell you my story. And, you know, this is where I went to school and there's the job that I had. And, and then they'll just open it up for questions. Uh, so that's a, another thing. It, we, Chicago has, has got lots of engineers. It's got a very strong chemical engineering community. So there's lots of folks to, to draw from. Um, but you know, the thing that's the really the best part of, of this AICHE business is that it's, it's an opportunity for students to learn about leadership. And this is the kind of the soft skills that you don't learn in calculus class. Um, and, and you know, I was talking about how engineers are typically end up being managers. The first job is a process engineer. Um, and, and being an engineer is really not all about equations. You got to know the equations and you'll use the equations maybe one day a week. But the rest of the time, you'll be managing projects and communicating with people and, and, and writing reports. And, you know, all of these skills um, are, are really important. And being part of a uh, something like AICHE or some extracurricular activity is is how you learn those skills, and um, you know there's lots of opportunities at IIT to, to participate in those things, and we strongly encourage students to do that because it's it's an important part of their education, and you know, it, it also there's the IPRO classes which are really all about doing those same sorts of things in, uh, in terms of project management and, and, and that sort of thing. That's a great question. It's like you almost uh, planned that question. Anyone else? Leah, Fernando, Leo, Zion? Uh, I had a question about the different, um, I don't know if they can be called uh, departments you were speaking of, of engineering. Yeah, yeah. For example, uh, do is there some overlap between like the chemical engineering department and for example, material engineering was like two, they were described as two separate when you were discussing about switching out majors? Yeah, they, they are, are different departments. And, and in fact, in the, the mechanicals and material engineering, mechanical aerospace and materials engineering department, there's actually three majors there. That as an undergraduate, you could study mechanical engineering, or you could study aerospace engineering, or you could study materials engineering. And they're all kind of similar. They have some overlap classes, but then they kind of get more specialized at the end. So you would need to pick one of those three. In chemical, chemical and biological engineering, we only have chemical engineering. We don't have a biological engineering um, degree. We have one of those at the graduate level, but not for undergraduates. Does that answer your question? Uh, yes. I also had a follow-up and like, uh -huh. so this would be, um, so you wouldn't have uh, like specializations, just for example, um, uh, UIC I think has a specialization of, of uh, energy and um, 
within chemical engineering? Uh, yeah, yeah we, we definitely have those specializations. We have one in, um, in, in bioengineering, there's a specialization in that, and there's one in energy, environment, and economics, and there's one in polymer systems, and there's one in process operations, and um, I feel like I'm forgetting one. Sukun, do you remember? Um, but yeah, these are all um, opportunities that, that that you can take advantage of. And, and really what a specialization is, is that in your degree, um, you have lots of required courses. So you, you have to take this math class, this chemistry class, these chemical engineering classes. But then you have um, four classes that are, are free electives, technical electives. They have to be technical courses. They could be, say, a math class or a chemistry class or an additional chemical engineering class. And so the specialization is you're going to take those electives and you're going to do them all in one area. So if you've got a specialization in, in polymers, you would take, um, I think it's three classes that are just focused on polymers out of your electives. If you did it in energy, then you'd have to take three classes in, in energy related uh, areas. And you've got a kind of a choice of which ones you want to take. Okay, thank you. Okay. Um, has anybody told you about the, the co-terminal degrees? That when you, when you are finishing your bachelor's degree, you can move on to a master's somewhat immediately. And, um, and in that case, let's say you're doing a degree in chemical engineering, and I'm just using this as an example that you could do with any major. You could be having a bachelor's degree in chemical engineering, and then you can get a master's degree in chemical engineering at kind of the same time. But you don't have to do that. You could also get a master's degree in biological engineering as, as part of your co-terminal degree. Or you could get a master's degree in um, biomedical engineering or physics or something else. And so you can kind of match these things up and it's kind of much, much larger than, um, uh, than a specialization. And, and it's also larger than, than a, a minor, which is another option. You can have your major in chemical engineering and then you can have a minor in something else like applied math, or business or something. Yeah, and I wanna jump in too and add to the uh, co-terminal degree point. Um, we also call it accelerated master's degree. Oh, that's what so, we call it. That's, yeah, so, so some of you I'm might old, be I'm used old, to that. Old school name, <laughs> it's supposed to be called accelerated master's, I forgot. But, but the one unique thing about those um, is in addition to earning both your bachelor's and master's in a shorter period of time, usually takes about five years, um, you're also getting your master's degree at the undergraduate tuition rate, which is not, not something that all universities offer. So that's something to think about if you want to get two degrees in a quicker amount of time for a more affordable price, then um, looking at that program is definitely something we recommend doing. And I can tell you lots of our students are, are in that, that program. I, I would say that maybe a quarter to a third of our, um, our seniors end up in co-terminal or accelerated masters. Any other questions? Oh yeah, I had one. Uh, does Illinois Tech offer just have connections for like postgraduate employment or internships for their major? I can also I can go ahead, go ahead. and take this one. Go ahead. Yes. Um, so we have this uh, department. It's a program called the Elevate Program, and they're really our central hub to connect students, not just to internships, but also co-ops, also special projects, competitions, and other areas. And so their office works very closely with the student to identify their areas of interest and connect them to the appropriate office. Um, the, our career development uh, department also does a similar thing where they help students with interview prep and internship prep. And our student organizations are actually a really, really big resource that a lot of incoming students do not think about. Um, I think men Donald mentioning AICHE, those students set up um, actual connections with 
current students to meet different mentors and professionals within the their degree programs to help them learn a little bit a little more about the companies that they work for, the day-to-day, -day, and um, make those connections too. And so because our students are very hands-on with planning those events, they actually make those connections directly rather than having to go through a professor or having to go through a specific staff member, which I think really strengthens the relationship and the networking and practicing that networking aspect too. Yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's very important. Um, the, the whole networking, that's how people find jobs. It's really not, um, you know, you go to monster.com or whatever the TV commercials are. It's really about networking and knowing the community. And we're very active with the Chicago local section and, um, you know, they have monthly events and we encourage students to go to these, these dinners, they're, they're welcome to go um, and, and meet the professional engineers that are out there. And, you know, they know which companies are offering jobs or who's looking for somebody. And that's, that's how you get to, to, to know these things is being part of that community and networking and, um, you know, making a good impression with, with, with people out there. Leah, I'm trying to ask you, think of the answer to your question um, about uh, how do you combine the smaller hydrocarbons to make bigger molecules? And I'm trying to remember the process. Um, I think it's called a Fischer-Tropes process is what they do. Um, they have to break it down. And so th this, this is how they, they got this thing called um, coal to gas. And I know we don't want to talk about coal these days, but there's, there's a, a way that you can take coal and you put it inside of a, um, it's a gasifier and it takes the, the carbon in the coal and you add water and then it makes um, like hydrogen and CO and then you can take the hydrogen and CO um, it's kind of like little tiny building blocks and you put it to this Fischer Tropes process and it'll put them together in certain ways and make um, bigger hydrocarbon chains and they'll get big enough that they'll end up being liquid fuel. It's not exactly the same as gasoline, you know, like synthetic gasoline, um, but there's definitely a way to put them all back together. But um, you gotta break it down into like the very smallest pieces, just carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And, and, and then you can kind of put it back together. Yeah, maybe we can read, uh, talk about the ITP class. Yeah, yeah. Um, so the way that it works is I teach the first class and what happens is that you'll get in contact with me or we will start getting in contact over the summer because I will be your academic advisor um, and I'll help you um, select courses for the fall and then one of those courses will be the ITP class. And so then I'll see you in the course. And if you've got problems with things, I'm right there as your advisor. And then, um, you know, cause you'll see me twice a week. And then when it's time to register for classes um, in, for the spring, then I'm right there and I can help you and I do the advising um, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and then after that in the spring, then Professor Hong takes over and talks about other things. Um, Sukun, why don't you talk about the topics that are covered in that, uh, those, those two freshman classes? Yeah, so uh, in my ITP class, um, uh, I'm gonna, uh, I, so I'm introduced about the, um, the key topics in the chemical engineering. So like you looked at uh, the, uh, the distillation column, there are many pipelines are connected to uh, between the different reactors. So uh, actually the, the crude oil, uh, they are moving from one reactor to the another reactor. And also sometimes uh, we need to apply the heat. So we need to control the temperature. <clears throat> so those kind of things. Um, understanding uh, the fluid motion behavior. Uh, so we are gonna look at, at the fluid mechanics and we are gonna look at the uh, mass transfer, heat transfer, and then we we also look at the uh, you know the crude oils. Uh, it contains lots of different chemicals. And then so uh, 
uh, we look at the, what kind of chemical reaction happens and then how we can predict them. So those kind of things, they are the, the core, uh, uh, <clears throat> core area of the chemical engineering. So by taking the ITP class, yeah, you are gonna taste uh, very little uh, about uh, those topics. So you're gonna have some um, picture about uh, the, the what chemical engineers do when you actually go to the industry. <clears throat> so those kind of things um, that you can learn uh, from the ITP class. Um, and also uh, uh, one thing I wanted to tell you is that um, at IIT, the ratio between faculty and students, uh, that, yeah, that's very uh, low, small. So you have the most frequent the interaction opportunity with the faculty. So <clears throat> uh, I highly recommend you to have the research opportunity while you are studying at IIT. So having the research experience means that somehow you know uh, the how to solve the problem, how to approach it, to analyze the problem, uh, and then how to apply your knowledge and skills to solve the problems. So uh, having the research experience is to learn about those kind of uh, the problem solving. So uh, usually the many companies, they like to hire uh, the person who have who has the research experience. So that's my recommendation. There's another element of this course that um, that I cover. Uh, it's kind of an objective that's that's non-standard for for uh, most courses. Is is try to to create a sense of community among the students. And so a lot of the the homework in my my course, and I, I, I constantly uh, kind of diss on my course, on this 100 course. I say it's not a real chemical engineering course because we kind of, we goof off a little bit, but we do a lot of projects. Um, and the projects are somewhat serious, but I put the students into different, into small groups and they work together on these projects. And then on the next project, I put them in other groups and I kind of mix up the assignments. And then they give presentations and they do, Lots of things, but the the real point of it though is for all the students to get to know each other, because after the first year, once you start getting into the serious chemicals engineering courses, then um, then they're going to need to study together, and and one of the, the things that I I like the most about IIT is that the students they study together is that it's it's they're very communal about how they study and try to work things out in classes. I've seen at other universities, they're very competitive and they, they don't even want to study with each other because then they'll give the other person an advantage and it's it's um, it's a little bit cutthroat. IIT is very good about, um, th that's our culture, is that we help each other. So, so that's another element of these first year courses. Awesome, thank you, Donald and Sukun. I know that we're a little bit over time. Um, but if anyone has any other questions, like please feel free to drop them into the chat um, as I do my closing spiel. Uh, but thank you all for your time tonight. Um, for you admitted students, just so you know, I know a lot of you guys are in the middle of still trying to decide where to attend college and it's been difficult because you haven't actually been able to visit campus. We are offering a limited number of visits every Monday and Friday. Um, of course, you need to prove the, uh, that you have a vaccination, both vaccinations after two weeks, as well as, um, or a PCR test. Um, we are also going to open up the opportunity to have summer visits. Um, our SOAR leaders, are, those are our orientation leaders, will be leading very small, limited groups of about five to six admitted students. So you will have the opportunity opportunity to tour campus and meet students. We'll release information on that a little bit closer to the summer when we will get the numbers and how we can accommodate everybody. Um, in the meantime, uh, both professors have dropped their email addresses into the chat room or chat bo uh, box. So if you all have any follow-up questions for, for them, please feel free to reach out. Uh, they are here to help you and answer your questions about the program. And with that, 
Um, I guess this is the end of tonight's event. So thank you again, everybody. And I hope to see you all in the fall.